Welcome everyone to QSMA's virtual Summit of Strength webinar series. This is Jessica with QSMA's Family Support Department, and we thank you all so much for joining with us today. We would like to thank our national presenting sponsors, Biogen, Genentech, and Novartis Gene Therapies, as well as platinum sponsor, Scholar Rock, for their generous support of the Summit of Strength webinar series. We appreciate all of the questions we received in advance of this webinar, and we will try to answer many of these during the presentation. You can also submit questions throughout the presentation using the chat box feature, which you will find located on your GoToWebinar toolbar. Please note that all lines will remain muted during the webinar other than for speakers. If you have any questions, please reach out to the Family Support Department at QSMA by emailing familysupport at qsma.org. We would now like to welcome our speaker, Dr. Robert Graham from Boston Children's Hospital. He'll be presenting on family readiness for emergencies. Welcome, Dr. Graham. Thank you. Um, so first, I, I do want to thank um, you know everyone at QSMA, and, and for those uh, attending today, I don't think everyone sort of appreciates how much effort that the entire QSMA staff have made to sort of you know continue to be a resource and avail themselves to the SMA community throughout the sort of uh, un unexpected COVID nineteen related uh, you know period that we continue to uh, you know grapple with. So. Um, as I move forward, and, and, and I think this is as relevant uh, when we talk about emergencies, um, we'll talk about sort of the range of that. Um, this is as uh, pertinent and germane an issue now uh, with the COVID-19 considerations as any time I've presented this in the past. So um, no immediate disclosures in terms of financial um, you know, conflicts uh, have been involved in a number of the research trials in the past. And then I'm actually on the, um, uh, QSMA board um, as a uh, as a volunteer um, and uh, have been engaged with QSMA for many many years now. Next slide. I do want to thank uh, I said QSMA the national chapter and then uh, our national organization and then uh, our New England chapter um, the CAPE team um, which is uh, the team that I work with here uh, in Boston. I'm an ICU uh, doctor but I also run a home ventilator program. Um, and our staff is invaluable uh, to me and, and to the families and, and uh, adults that we work with as well. Um, and then Basil Doris is uh, our primary neurologist here in Boston, and, and he's really organized a phenomenal multidisciplinary uh, team um, over the last uh, actually 15 years or so, um, and I uh, hope that we can avail ourselves again to the community at large. And I also have to recognize in the past, I've actually done this presentation with a parent, um, Al Friedman and um, previously, and then Jen Smith most recently. Um, and it, it is one of those things that please uh, feel free to, to um, participate in the chat. And if you have, you know, at the end, I'd like to, you know, have people, if there are questions um, or recommendations, I think that's uh, very helpful. Next slide. So what I, I'd like to do, the objectives of this um, is, uh, you know, to talk about the fact that what's happened in the SMA community, uh, scientific and medical and general community, um, is new um, to most of those in the general, you know, population and, and really even amongst the medical community. Um, and uh, most people are not up to date on, on what's happened um, in, the, in the last, certainly last two, three, four, five years and, and beyond that in terms of the gene therapies, the clinical supports and, and everything um, that you've all contributed to. Um, what I do want to do is and I'll spend a lot of time for is, you know, going over how do we prepare for the emergencies that, that are going to happen. Um, and, you know, defining emergency is, is a broad, um, you know, uh, sort of, uh, you know, it takes a broad considerations, and, and we'll talk about that. It, it's really that sort of preparation. That emergency could happen on your way to the grocery store. That emergency could that could happen could be a global pandemic. Um, they're very different, um, but there are some commonalities in terms of how you want to sort of think about it. Um, I think it's helpful to think about how do individuals with SMA, whether you're a child, whether you're an adult, whether you're the family member of someone with SMA, you know, how is that going to alter, you know, your preparedness, but also your experience during that emergency? Um, you know, talk about some of the practical things um, and uh, navigating uh, both emergencies, but also the acute care hospital, if that's where you wind up. And then, as I said, I want to spend some time sharing experiences about 
and this will be sort of integrated throughout the talk in terms of um, how, what are some solutions and what have people done. Um, unbeknownst to me, as we scheduled this webinar, uh, this is apparently National Preparation Month or National Preparedness Month, um, which I wasn't aware and went to the um, uh, Homeland Security website and they have a ready check um, uh, site. Um, which actually does provide some nice lists as to how anyone should uh, prepare for emergencies. Um, and then uh, Jen Smith, uh, as I mentioned before, she um, she recently sent me some links to um, enteral preparation. So those who have feeding tubes and things like that, um, you know, people have generated a number of lists for themselves and, and put them out there in terms of how do you prepare. So it, there are a lot of resources out there and I think, um, so again, you have to think broadly in terms of what are your individual needs. Um, most recently, I've actually been working, you know, with all of the tropical storms and hurricanes um, on the uh, sort of southeast coast and, and Gulf region. I've gotten calls and worked with families around when do you leave? What do you need to bring with you? Um, if you can't leave, you know, how do you prepare for that? And, and I think, you know, it, every region has its environmental issues, and, and we sort of have to think about that. Next slide. So uh, this is the tip of the iceberg. Um, I use this slide for a number of things. Uh, first of all, it just sort of harkens me back to where I'm from originally in, in Alaska. And, and actually the resources there, depending on where you were, were slim. Um, it also is illustrative of the fact that there's a lot more than I'm gonna talk about today. Um, and again, access QSMA for other resources. Uh, it's also illustrative of the fact that I'm not the smartest guy in the world because that is an iceberg and 90% of it is below me um, underneath the water. Next slide. So um, I think it is helpful, as I said, I'm gonna, I want you to sort of think about yourselves or your family members um, with SMA um, and you know how that might differentiate you from other people that encounter the medical or, or uh, you know collide with the medical systems and, and, uh, and otherwise. And that could be um, everything from primary care to EMS trucks, to the, um, you know, to your local hospital, to a big, you know, tertiary care hospital. Um, and, you know, the, one of the first things is, is, is professional attitudes. Next slide. Um, you know, as we think about professional attitudes, um, it's, it's, as I said, what has happened with SMA um, has far surpassed where the medical community understands SMA is. Um, that you are connecting with people through Cure SMA and in your, your neurology, your SMA clinics that are familiar with what's happened with SMA in terms of the treatments and supportive measures and things like that. That does not represent the vast majority of people in the medical community um, from any discipline. Um, these five, uh, you know, articles that I included here and, and, and it's it, the content of these is more you know, important in the sense that what it reflects with neuromuscular conditions, with spinal muscular atrophy and Duchenne's, is that practitioners are still reflecting on what is more historical experience, that most people with SMA died. Uh, those with, you know, people with muscular dystrophy or the young men with muscular dystrophy got worse and worse, and ultimately they died of, of various complications, and that there was this sort of perspective that there was little to do. Well, I think Although that has changed dramatically, I think that many of you may still encounter that. And, um, you know, as a result, your experience and what is offered and what you have to advocate for can be challenging. Next slide. Reconfigured parental roles. Um, next slide. Um, you know, this is something that I think is challenging for any person with um, a chronic health condition, whether you're a child, you're, you're the family member, um, or you're an adult. Um, go ahead, next slide. Um, you know, you are bringing with you to an emergency a lot of experience, um, both that is generally applicable to medical emergencies or otherwise, but also specific to you. Um, this is actually taken from um, a mother that I work with. Uh, her child has a lot of complex needs, and I think this applies, and you could substitute um, you know, physical therapist, RN, um, you know, nutritionist uh, for the MD up there is that, you know, many of you actually, you know, do a lot of things on your own or in conjunction with your uh, SMA team and that you're bringing the expertise with you during an emergency. Go ahead, next slide. 
Um, and, you know, as we sort of think about how this applied to uh, COVID-19 and, and where we are now, um, you know, it's interesting, and, and all of you are probably aware that we fortunately haven't seen a lot of complications with, with coronavirus uh, in the SMA community. And I think, you know, it's, it's that most people were in the SMA community calibrated to this already, that you're already taking precautions and that you had this sort of preparedness anyway for when things went wrong. Um, and so, you know, uh, this, this uh, you know, slide was sent to me from a, another family who, you know, in, at the time said, you know, we're ready for this. Uh, the rest of the world isn't. And, and I think that's true to an extent, but it's always helpful to uh, sort of remind ourselves. Next slide. Um, idiosyncratic clinical trajectory. I, I think this is helpful. And, you know, as much progress as uh, there has been with, and, and I think about the next bullet as well, is that as much progress as there's been in SMA um, is, is that there are things we can't predict. Next slide. What we do know is that any child who is technology dependent, and the same applies for adults, um, you have a much higher risk of needing an ICU during, you know, during your lifetime. Um, you know, the study that, that I've sort of pulled the table from here um, is out of the state of New York, and it's, it's quite some time ago, but what it, I think it's helpful you can see, um, you know, if you take someone who's previously healthy, and they're sort of your reference point, and then you look at people with, you know, this is for children with chronic conditions, you know, anyone with a chronic condition makes sense, is at high risk of winding up in an ICU. Um, and in this study, they looked at the whole state of New York, it was a 3.3 relative risk, so 3.3 times greater risk of winding up in an ICU during the course of a year. If you were technology assisted, and that was feeding tubes, that was BiPAP, that was tracheostomy, um, you had a 373 times greater risk of winding up in an ICU during the course of that year. Um, and that's not to say that you're any more vulnerable, it's just that, well, I mean, yeah, actually, it, it, it's that there are things that can go wrong. It's that it's either related to the technology or it's related to why you need it or other circumstances that bring all that together when you're sick that you need that type of support. And we're seeing that, you know, again, throughout the country and the trends sort of continue that way. Next slide. And so I think, you know, we'd be remiss if we didn't sort of acknowledge that. And, and you know, when I think about sort of, uh, you know, things that uh, you have to sort of prepare for, um, if you look at this young man, and I know a number of you are engaged in a lot of activities uh, in the community, or at least were prior to COVID, um, you know, this young man, um, you know, is involved in power soccer, very active in it um, and loves it. And he's out there and, and never wants to come off the court. Um, but uh, we've also had with him a couple of episodes where he winds up with significant nausea and vomiting and dehydration during these episodes. And it was actually mo his mom who realized that this was all probably related to motion sickness, that this spinning that he does in his power chair, he doesn't tolerate after a full day or even, you know, a half a day's worth of games and stuff like that. And so, you know, she always brings with her a scopolamine patch and puts that on before the games or before the tournaments and things like that. And, you know, this wasn't an emergency, but it could become so. And then, you know, had previously he'd wind up in an ER. And so now it's, it's no longer an issue. And, and, and so when I'm talking about preparedness for emergencies, it could be as simple as going to a power soccer tournament. It doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, um, you know the, the natural disaster. Okay, next slide. And yeah, the technologic advances and successes, I think this is, again, this is, as I was saying, that, you know, SMA, um, you know, the SMA world has moved forward and outpaced a lot of, um, you know, what the rest of the medical community is sort of aware of. Um, previously, this was related to the types of supports we were doing. It was the different types of BiPAP and, uh, you, know, you know, the decision-making and things like that. You know, in the last 10 years, as we've seen the you know introduction of now three new therapies, um, it's it's remarkable. Um, and but I think what we also do in terms of that preparation for emergencies is is recognizing that we are still vulnerable as a community. That you know individuals with SMA still have needs, and that you know despite treatment with whatever drug it is, that um, you know we still have to sort of acknowledge a, a degree of vulnerability. Next slide. So 
in that preparation, um, as they call it, is do-it-yourself do emergency services, um, the DIY, there are advantages and, and disadvantages of that. Um, next, next bullet. Um, you know, we talk about family-centered care and we talk about the fact that you are a resource, but the challenge with that is that you are now burdened with a lot of things. So if you are encountering, you know, an EM, you know, an EMS call and an ambulance shows up, they may know absolutely nothing about SMA. Um, and to them, uh, you know, they are the hammer and, you know, you're a nail. And so you're gonna, they're going to hit you like they do anybody else. And um, so, you know, it's, it's a challenge when you're sort of thinking about, I'm focusing on myself or my family member, but I'm also having to educate the person, you know, who, who's in front of me in the emergency room or in the clinic or otherwise. Next slide. Um, your pediatrician's office should be a resource. Um, and I, I think, you know, I can't underemphasize this. Um, you know, many times, uh, you know, in the SMA clinic, we say always call us. But in fact, actually, um, it's also very helpful to have your pediatrician's office, um, you know, ready for you. Um, you know, it could be routine things, um, you know, sort of the fever evaluation, the ear check, you name it, but also in terms of, you know, how do you even navigate other things? First of all, they're going to have probably as intimate understanding of the rest of your family, assuming if you have other children or you have siblings or otherwise, um, they're a great resource. And usually they're a lot closer to you than we are in, you know, you know a large center SMA clinic. Next slide. Um, passports, emergency information forms, um, post forms, that's the orders for life-sustaining treatment, those types of things are very important to have. And everyone has, uh, or a lot of people have sort of developed their own. You know, we, you know, families used to carry around giant binders full of papers um, and, you know, sort of descriptions of, you know, what their problems are, who their providers are, basically a small, you know, compilation of their medical histories. We've transitioned now, people use them on thumb drives. Uh, there are now sort of, you know, virtual passports in the cloud. What you essentially want is something that's going to provide a snapshot of who you are, what SMA is, um, and then who's helping, who can help that, help you help your providers. Um, so, you know, are you linking back to me if I'm your provider? And so that when you show up in an ER, they can say, oh, we'll call Dr. Graham, or, oh, we'll call Dr. Shell, who's a pulmonologist in, you know, Ohio, or, you know, whomever your resource is. Um, so I think, you know, it's one of those uh, types of things that you want to find what works best for you, what's most portable, and then also what's going to be received at wherever you think you'll wind up in an emergency. Next bullet. Local and regional facilities, as I said, this is one of the things, is you, you need to sort of um, find out where you're going to go um, if there is a problem. Um, and one of the things we know looking at patterns is that oftentimes, if it's not an emergency, you're, most people bypass their local facilities because they know that they may or may, may not be able to provide for them. And that's fine if it's not emergent. Um, but if things are sort of smoldering and you're able to get past that, that's okay. But if it's truly emergent and you call 911, you wanna know where you're going to go. Um, you know, is it the hospital that's two miles away? Is it the hospital that's 15 miles away or 25 miles away? Uh, depending on where you live in the country, some of those distances can get quite large. And you know, you wanna be able to identify those in advance and maybe reach out to them and say, by the way, if I have a problem or my child has a problem, this is, you know, this is where I'm coming and, and, and provide them with some resources, refer them to Cure SMA, um, you know, just to get some basic information. Next bullet. Pediatric transport teams, um, you know, these are helpful. Um, all ambulances are not created equal. Um, I, I think that's helpful to know is that, you know, um, oftentimes they may or not, may not be comfortable with equipment that you have. So if you have BiPAP, if you have a vent, um, if you have a cough assist, um, most ambulance companies and most ambulance providers aren't going to know what those are. They may not actually even have approval to use them. Um, so depending on who it is, they may ask, you know, a family member to come into the back of an ambulance. Um, to help manage that. Um, sometimes they actually don't allow that and it's more of a problem. Um, 
And so if there's access to a pediatric transport team, um, you know, at your major academic center or something like that, if you wind up at a local hospital and you need to be transported to, to a larger center, you can request someone who might have a little bit more knowledge of the situation. Um, not always available, but, but uh, many of your, your uh, you know, SMA centers are going to have that as an option, um, so to reach out. Next bullet. Contingency plans, now this is crucial. Um, you know, it's uh, been less of an issue as none of us have really been leaving our houses for the last nine months. Um, but, um, you know, I think it is one of the things that we always talk about when people are preparing to go to the QSMA conferences, uh, you know, are you driving to Florida? Are you driving to Los Angeles? Are you hopping on a plane or a train or otherwise, you know, um, you know, sort of mapping that out. What could possibly go wrong? you know, from the moment I leave my door to the moment, you know, when I'm in, you know, at the conference or I'm on vacation or otherwise, or just going to school, um, you know, having things set up in case there's a problem. Again, um, you know, I think in the past people in, a, in this session have talked about if you're, if you use a, a wheelchair is to tape on that wheelchair contact information and a little information about yourself. Um, you know, uh, people have talked about if you're in a car accident and they see someone in a wheelchair, there are going to be a lot of assumptions. And so taping on that wheelchair, number one, hey, call so-and-so. Number two, I can talk and I'm normal. So if I'm not, there's a problem. Um, you know, it, it's helpful to have some basic information like that um, sort of available. And again, if you're <laughs> once we all resume traveling, it's helpful to map out. If you go on a road trip to say, you know, if I'm driving from Boston down to Orlando, what are the centers that I could stop at if I have a problem? Next bullet. And then, you know, although a little bit morbid uh, to talk about, it's always helpful to have advanced directives and healthcare proxies. Um, it's less of an issue for, you know, our younger people with SMA, but certainly as we look at our adolescents and our adults with SMA, this is essential, is to say, you know, if I have a problem, number one, again, People need to know who I am, um, but also what I want. And if I can't communicate for myself, you know, who can communicate for me? And you know, if you wind up in an adult hospital, this is a mandate: is that you have to identify a healthcare proxy. But it's helpful for anyone as we sort of think about, uh, you know, preparations. Next slide. So once you do wind up in an ICU or an ER or an acute care hospital. Um, you might think it's a time to relax. Most of you probably realize that it's not. Next bullet. So um, it's helpful to, if you can in advance, if you know the ED you're going to, as I mentioned above, or you know the ICU that you have gone to in the past for surgeries or just other admissions for pneumonias or dehydration, is that you may be able to, you know, they sometimes keep quote shadow files um, on patients where you can have a plan of care in place. Um, and so if, if you're a frequent flyer, as it were, um, you know, hopefully most of you aren't, but it's helpful to sometimes have that and they can, um, you know, they can help sort of facilitate the care and, and you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. Next bullet. Direct admissions. This may or may not be possible. Um, it's actually gotten far more complicated, uh, you know, in the context of COVID uh, and otherwise. But in the past, depending on the facility you're at and who your providers are, they can sometimes arrange direct admissions. So if you say, you know, I, I know something's brewing or we're at a point, you can bypass an emergency room um, and they'll be able to directly admit you. Um, not always the case. And, and as I said, as the, as the landscape has changed with, with coronavirus, um, this has been not, ex not really feasible in the short term. Next bullet. Um, all I can say is, yes, uh, this is this. If there's a take home from this is to uh, this whole talk, it's to reach out is to, you know, reach out to your primary care, reach out to your specialist, reach out to whoever is able to advocate for you um, when there is an emergency. So that when you wind up in an ED or an ICU, especially if it's not your home base, um, is that you want someone to be able to, you know, uh, speak to the providers there because they may or may not, good or bad, be receptive to you handing them here's a care plan, um, or hey, I know more about SMA than you do. Um, and so, you know, egos and hubris and other things often get in the way, and so it's helpful sometimes to reach out. Next bullet. 
And then, you know, once you're, again, once you're at the hospital, every hospital has a little different process in place. Um, you know, do you, the questions come up, do you transfer from their hospital to a, med a major SMA center? Um, if you stay at a hospital, um, where are you within that hospital? Are you on a general ward? Are you in an intermediate care unit? Are you in an ICU? Um, there are lots of variables, some of which are related to you, but some of which are related to the nuances of the hospital and their process. Like, you know, not all hospitals let people use BiPAP when they're on the ward or uh, they have to be in a monitored bed. Um, you know, if you have a tracheostomy and a ventilator, you have to be in an ICU, obviously, but there are, every everyone has a sort of different system in place. And so I think it's helpful to sort of advocate for yourself and say, where's the most appropriate hospital? And within that hospital, where's the most appropriate place? I, and then on the back end, you know, um, I have to say that I, I've had incidences where I've had, you know, people with SMA come in, they've got a fever and a rash, but they're otherwise fine, they're hydrated, they just wanted someone to look at them, and then ED has refused to send them home because something might happen. They have SMA, something might happen. Um, so again, reaching back to your, your, your team and saying, you know what, it's okay for me to go home, I'm comfortable with it, we have follow-up plans in place, and, and sort of help you know individualize that sort of threshold as to you know when when can you go home um, and the same applies for once you're admitted it's like what's that threshold next slide so um, as I said you you may the experience in in any given hospital and any given admission is not necessarily a pleasant one and and you maybe may feel like you're you're fighting a, a losing battle sometimes um, and, and you're not alone um, and again so reach out next slide um and and you know as i said it's not a time to breathe uh, take a, a a breath and, and a sigh of relief um you know this is from a study i did with uh with families of children with a lot of uh, other complex issues um actually a couple of which had sma and, and i think the takeaways are as i listed here is that you know one of the things that everyone expresses is that they want people in the in the hospital to know what they're like normally um and because how they look when they're sick is not how they are when they're at school or at a job or, or otherwise and, and members of families. Uh, is This is a time when the, the uh, hospital providers, the ICU should reach out. Um, if, if you're encouraging them to, they should also reach out. And, and I have to say it's something that we're remiss about oftentimes is that we don't call the primary care necessarily. Um, and we expect that the consulting service will know everything about SMA um, that they may or may not. Um, so unfortunately, some of that falls on you as the, as the uh, family member or the individual. Um, I can't emphasize this enough uh, for the parents or the, or the loved ones of someone with SMA. There's always a disconnect between what you do at home um, and what you're allowed to do in the ICU. And, and that can sometimes be really challenging. Um, and uh, as I said, there can be a lot of conflict there. And, and I think sort of at least acknowledging that to the team and saying, look, I usually do this. Can I help you with it? Or this is how we would usually do it at home. Um, those types of things can be very helpful um, and, uh, uh, you know, sort of avert some potential conflicts. Um, again, we know that the ICU is not respite. Um, it doesn't feel like it when you're there. Um, and, you know, a lot of the families talked about the fact that, you know, it's a place where they can learn so that they can implement things at home and not come back. So, um, yeah, take advantage of that if you can, although, again, it's exhausting. I think there's also recognition that not all of you are the same. Every family, every individual with SMA is different. And so um, your experience in the ICU and what you need in the ICU is different as well. Um, and so, uh, you know, to remind people that, yes, you may have taken care of someone with SMA last year, but it wasn't me. Um, and that this is what I need. Um, so next slide. Um, again, uh, as I said, a reverse quarantine may feel like Hotel California and you can't check out or you can check out, but you can never leave. Um, you know, your job, unfortunately, is, as I said, is to educate people around SMA and your needs. So in preparation for those emergencies, bring your equipment bring a, a, a protocol for respiratory supports, those types of things. It's not uncommon, even at the big centers, for them to have a limited number of masks. They may only have one cough assist for the entire, you know, 
ICU or even the whole hospital, depending on, on where you are. And, and, and some local and regional hospitals may never even heard of a cough assist device. So, um, so if you're anticipating this, you know, if it's, if it's not a hang up the, you know, 911, hang up the phone and, and, uh, and, and rushing to the hospital, try and sort of prepare some of these things. Um, calibrating provider's decime, as I said, this is again, one of those take homes is that it's not just a muscle issue. It's not just a breathing issue that there are other things we have to think about. Um, and we know that nutrition is one of the things that people focus on, um, you know, it's helpful to sort of calibrate, um, you know, everyone to SMA uh, and not just focus on one aspect of it. Um, you know, uh, up to date I have on there listed. Um, so up to date is a, uh, think of it as sort of the medical Google um, and uh, a lot of trainees um, and actually a lot of, um, you know, uh, you know, providers from multiple disciplines, nursing, you know, physicians or otherwise who are long out of training will go to up to date. Um, and it's a website and it's it's peer reviewed. It's actually quite rigorous. Um, but the fact is, it's limited in terms of what it tells people about SMA. Um, and so um, that's going to be, you know, if, if someone says, oh, you've got a patient with SMA coming into your unit or to your ER, this is one of the first places they'll go. What I, I want to impress upon you is that's not going to tell them a lot. And so, again, you're going to need to reach out. You're going to need to inform them about yourself and SMA. Next slide. Um, if you need, uh, you know, whether it's a scheduled procedure or you come in because you have a broken leg or a broken arm or, you know, you have an appendicitis or, or whatever, you know, or a dental abscess for that matter. Um, I think there are things we need to think about in that sort of preparation or sort of anticipate uh, averting a problem. First of all, there's no such thing as conscious sedation. Um, I think that's something that it's, it's a misnomer um, in the sense that if you are sedated enough that you don't feel them resetting a bone or you don't feel them extracting your wisdom tooth, um, then you're probably not fully conscious um, that you are at risk for breathing problems, that you are at risk for aspirating, um, and you probably aren't going to be able to communicate as well. So um, think about that if you're having a procedure, whether it's scheduled or not. Um, if it is an invasive thing, if it's you're going in for, you know, orthopedic surgery that's planned, spinal surgery or hip surgery or, or other things, um, you know, there are options depending on what is being done. If you're maybe just having uh, releases of uh, ankle contractures, for instance, you may or may not need to be intubated. Or if you're having, you know, spinraza injections, you don't have to be on a ventilator. You may be able to just be mastered if you're, you know, if you have a, you know, a, a, a child or a toddler who needs more sedation. Um, there are options. Um, so, so reach out to your providers and, or even reach back to QSMA and, and, and they can connect you with other people. What are the options? Regional uh, anesthetics, so blocks. So if you're having surgery on your arm or your leg or something, that there might be options for putting in catheters so you, you can get away with less general anesthesia but still have pain control. Um, there are lots of protocols. If you do wind up on a ventilator to think about, you know, when do you extubate, when do you come off that breathing machine. Um, and, and I do want to, you know, caution people, uh, there's always been sort of a I wouldn't say misunderstanding, but sort of a hesitancy to use oxygen. And, and it's not that oxygen is a bad thing because it's helpful. You don't want your oxygen levels falling, but it's to remind people that it's not to be used by itself. So if I don't have a muscle problem and I don't have lung disease, oxygen is what I need when I'm, you know, if I have a pneumonia. Um, but if you have SMA, you want that BiPAP, you want that cough assist, you want those other measures in place as well as oxygen and you know that it's um if you're desaturated it's it's about using all of those tools not just the oxygen um the aggressive airway clearance the non-invasive um I, I do want to remind people as well is that they're often hesitant to use pain medications um opiates specifically morphine and dilaudid and those types of things as we worry about the sort of you know national opiate crisis um and potential for abuse or dependence and other things like that. But it's also helpful to remind people that, you know, if you're recovering from a spine surgery or hip surgery and you have pain, you're not gonna breathe well if you're in pain. And that, that 
all of these drugs and, and options do have a role in the short term to sort of help you through that. Um, again, if you're in the hospital for any reason, stay ahead of those nutrition uh, issues and stay on top of bowel regimens because all of that sort of creates a, a you know, potentially problematic cycle and, uh, that you can get into. Next slide. So other uh, things as we sort of think about, you know, if you are, if you do have an emergency and you wind up in a hospital, next bullet point is that, um, you know, there are challenges that you may encounter. So some hospitals will allow a parent or a family member to accompany you into the OR or to a procedure room. Not all of them do. Work that out in advance. Um, you just don't want those problems to arise. So if you've got a scheduled procedure, whether it's for, you know, um, spinoza dosing or, you know, as I said, you know, another surgery or dental procedures is, is to work that out in advance. And it's, again, it's a time if you're an adult to work out who's that healthcare proxy who can speak for me. Next bullet. Um, this often comes up again as it pertains to advanced directives, uh, some places, and there are going to be lots of assumptions. If you say, if they see, oh, you've got SMA, they're going to assume that you're going to have limitations perhaps in terms of what you want done. Be clear, and it's helpful to know that in advance. Next bullet. Um, and as I said, it's hard uh, if you've got any sedation, to communicate. And if you have sedation on board and you can't move as well, even normally, um, you know, having someone there who can speak to you or to speak to the providers in advance of this to say, hey, these are the things that show that I'm having a problem. Um, you know, again, anticipate that. Don't let it become an emergency. Next slide. And then uh, one of the biggest challenges that we have, and I think we're all sort of facing, um, is the transitions in care. People with SMA are living long lives, which is phenomenal. Uh, for good or bad, where you received your care as a child is, n they may or may not be receptive to you continuing your care, whether you're turning 19, whether you're turning 22, whether you're turning 27 or 35, every hospital has its own sort of threshold. Um, and so it's helpful to know that in advance and sort of prepare that because what you will encounter is that the familiarity with SMA, which took a long time to get there in the in a children's hospital or a pediatric center, is not necessarily going to be there at an adult hospital. And so anticipating those needs is, is going to be important. Next slide. And then I have my personal biases that, you know, uh, reaching back from, from uh, you know, the acute care hospital, um, you know, one of the reasons I do our home ventilator program and I'm involved in the SMA clinic is to help you with this stuff at home so that there aren't emergencies. Next slide. So one of the main things, and, and I'll, I'm almost uh, wrapping up here, I, I think it's helpful as, um, you know, as you think about that preparedness is that these, these are actually three nice references um, and uh, a number of people who are intimately involved with uh, Cure SMA were on these, these first two guidelines, um, sort of the most up-to-date sort of recommendations for SMA. Um, and you can actually access these uh, through the Cure SMA site. Um, and, and these are helpful for your team, um, as well as those who just don't know anything about SMA. And it talks about uh, sort of all aspects of care. As I said, rehabilitation, you know, obviously you probably have your diagnosis, but rehabilitation, orthopedics, pulmonary care, you name it, the, the intent was to sort of review what literature was there so that the medical community knows what's going on, but also anticipate what might happen in the future, and especially with the new treatments and, and, and trials that are ongoing. Um, the last uh, sort of citation there is something I was able to work on with uh, Peter Kang and some others, um, you know, especially when it pertained to COVID-19, there was lots of concern and, and, and still probably continued to be that an individual with SMA not, may not receive the equal care or similar care to someone without SMA if they present with coronavirus or, or some other need during this sort of pandemic time. And, and this is a nice article sort of, A, bringing people up to date on where things are with SMA um, and other neuromuscular disorders but also to suggest to them that, you know, in fact, actually you and the community with SMA are actually should be considered for equal access um, and supports during the, these uh, sort of challenging times. 
Um, and, and the last bullet on there is QSMA is always the reference for you. It's like if you get someplace and, and A, you can't think of, you know, what should I send them or, or who do I tell them is to reach out to QSMA and, and that'll provide them at least some context. Next slide. So I'm hoping that, you know, through the last 40 minutes or so, 35, 40 minutes, and, and uh, happy to take questions, is, is submit them through the chat, um, is, you know, we've sort of, you know, reviewed some things to anticipate, how to help you prepare for an event. Um, again, there are lots of um, sort of individualized lists that people have. Um, as I said, you know, people come up with checklists, as you might for any emergency. Is it the extra batteries um you know if you're in a school is there you know is there access to an elevator what if there's a power outage and how do you actually leave you know go from a second floor of a school down uh, or in the workplace for that matter um you know uh actually it came up at one of our summits in the past is you know that the you know where kids go during a fire drill um there may not be access for someone who's using a power chair so you know understanding what that sort of event might be and anticipating it, although it's a degree of paranoia for every aspect of your life is, is helpful. Again, hopefully you'll be able to help you sort of identify where is it that you're going to confront medical issues and differentiate yourself from other people in the medical community um, and then help you sort of navigate that hospital uh, stay or the emergency stay and ultimately, you know, ideally sort of avert it. Um, so I'll, I'll wrap up here, next slide, and uh, happy to take questions uh, if, if any have come in through the uh, course of the uh, of this talk. Um, again, you know, we're always available and uh, at any point you can always reach back to uh, CureSMA is, is, is truly, I think if you're struggling with, a, with an issue in terms of preparedness or, or problems you've had with emergencies, uh, there are undoubtedly other members of the community that have experienced that as well and we're happy to help you navigate that. So thank you. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Graham. Hi everyone, this is Colleen from CureSMA Family Support Department. And if you have any questions, you can also just go ahead and email those in to familysupport at curesma.org. We would now like to introduce Jared Tonga Anabi from Genentech, who will be sharing their presentation and update from Genentech. Jared? Thanks so much, Colleen, and uh, greetings, everyone. I am delighted to be here today and tell you a little bit about FRISD, which has been proven to make a difference in infants, it's been proven to make a difference in children, and it's been proven to make a difference in adults with SMA. And this is including people uh, two months and older who have a broad range of symptoms and motor functions. Next slide, please. As Colleen said, my name is Jared Tonga Onabai, and I am a Partnership and Access Liaison, or PAL for short. And the role of the PAL is to be the local main point of contact from Genentech that supports people living with SMA throughout their treatment journey. I wanted to share this photo. This is a, uh, this is a picture of the entire uh, PAL team that covers the country. And these are folks that are very eager and very passionate about, passionate about supporting the community. And while a lot of us do have a background in healthcare, uh, it's important to note that we cannot provide medical advice within this role, as that is a conversation that you should always have with your healthcare provider. Next slide, please. So we don't have a lot of time today, so I wanna give a brief overview on what FRISD is and how it works, how it's being studied and what are those results of those studies, how to take it and what support services Genentech has to offer. If you have any questions after this or you want to learn more, I would encourage you to reach out to your PAL or your local PAL, and I can tell you how to do that a little bit later on in the presentation. But for now, let's talk a little bit about what FRISD is. Next slide. So FRISD is a prescription medication used to treat spinal muscular atrophy or SMA in adults and children two months of age and older. It's not currently known if a FRISD is safe and effective in children under two months of age. Now, I know that safety is always of paramount importance, so I want to get into a little bit of detail about this next bullet point. So before taking a FRISD, you want to make sure you tell your doctor if you have any liver problems. Make sure you tell them if you're pregnant or plan on becoming pregnant, or if you're breastfeeding or planning to breastfeed. As a FRISD may harm an unborn or breastfed baby, and may affect a man's ability to have children. And as always, you should tell your doctor about any other medications that you might be taking. 
Now, this is not all the potential side effects that, uh, that are associated with FRISD. I will revisit some more a little bit later on the, in this presentation, but you can also refer to the full of RISD prescribing information that's in the handout section in the toolbar. Next slide. So how does RISD work? As you may or may not know, SMA is characterized by the body's inability to produce viable SMN protein. SMN standing for or stands for survival of motor neuron. And RISD works by helping the body not only make, but to maintain more SMN protein. And what I mean by that, to be more specific, is that we found in clinical studies that within four weeks of starting RISD, we found that median SMN protein levels more than doubled. And also, what is important, they were also maintained over the 12-month period they were being studied across all SMA types. So let's take a look at, how, at who was being studied in these clinical trials. Next slide. So we, the goal was to really be as inclusive as possible with, when it came to this study. And so it, it enabled us to study a broad range of infants, children, and adults with SMA. And this resulted in more than 450 people being in the studies with type 1, 2, or 3 SMA. And that uh, ranged from ages 2 months all the way up to 60 years. Let's take a little bit deeper dive into what those studies look like now. Next slide. So there's a lot of information on this slide. And I want to sort of orient you to it. So on the left is the first study, and that's the firefish study, and that's highlighted in the red, and that's the study of infants with type 1 SMA. It was a two-part study, and that included dose finding, safety, and effectiveness. The second study, which is on the right, it's highlighted in yellow, is the sunfish study, and that studied children and adults with type 2 and 3 SMA. Again, it was a two-part study that studied dose finding, safety, and effectiveness, this was a little bit different in that it was randomized and placebo controlled. Uh, placebo controlled meaning that you had a group that took FRISD for 12 months, and then you had another group that took a substance that did not have any active FRISD in it for 12 months, and they were assigned to those groups randomly. And that will, that will be relevant in a couple of slides when I tell you about the results of Sunfish. Now, there's also a third supportive study called Jewelfish, which is, um, recent, which is being currently looked at for people with types one, two, or three SMA that were previously treated with other SMA medications. So just to summarize, you got, you got firefish, which is your infants with type one, you've got sunfish, which is your children and adults with type two and three, and then you've got jewelfish, which is type one, two, and three that have been on other medications for SMA in the past. So let's take a look at some of the uh, results from firefish. Next slide. Now, the infants that were in firefish, they, they ranged from anywhere from three to seven months, uh, with a lot of them actually being closer to seven months. And what we found is those infants in the firefish study achieved a key motor milestone. Uh, namely, 41% of them were able to sit for at least five seconds without support after taking FRSD for 12 months. Now, this is notable in that uh, infants with type 1 SMA are not expected to be able to sit without support if they are left untreated. Um, now, another uh, endpoint that we wanted to look at was the ability to breathe without permanent support. So let's take a look at that now. Next slide, please. So as you can see here on the left side, um, we're looking at the infants at 12 months, and we, we saw that 90% were alive and could breathe without permanent support. You fast forward to 23 months, and we saw that 81% were alive and could breathe without permanent support. So now let's take a look over at uh, the, uh, some of the results for the sunfish trial. Next slide. Now, again, a reminder, the, the sunfish trial was for children and adults with type 2 and 3. There's a lot of information going on this slide. So the main takeaway that I want you to come away with is the children and adults that were in the sunfish trial, they showed an improvement in their motor functions after being on a RISD for 12 months versus the people that were on the study that took the placebo that actually saw a decline in their score after 12 months. And that is illustrated by this graph. So if you take a look here, you're looking at time from zero to 12 months from left to right. And the group that took FRISD is, is uh, represented by the blue line. And you can see over the 12 month period that their scores are increasing. Um, that is versus the, the group that took the placebo that is characterized by the gray line. And as you can see over 12 months, uh, their scores actually decline, and you can see over there at the end that there's a gap between the two. And that was measured by a tool called the Motor Function Measure 32 Item Scale, 
or the MFM32. Now, I told you back a little bit a couple of slides ago that I wanted to revisit safety again, so let me just go ahead and do that now. Next slide, please. So again, just as a reminder, FRSD is being studied in people from two months to 60 years with types one, two, or three SMA. And some of the most common side effects that we found within FRSD that was across type one, two, and three were fever, diarrhea, and rash. Now there were some additional common side effects with the type one infants, and that included vomiting, constipation, lung infection, and symptoms associated with rest upper respiratory uh, infection. So that was your runny noses, uh, your sore throat, sneezing, and coughing. Now it's important to note that nobody stopped taking FRSD due to these common side effects. And again, a reminder that safety is being studied in people that were previously treated with other SMA medications in the Jewelfish trial. Uh, next, next slide. So how do we take it? How do we take FRSD? So it's the first and it's the only medication to treat SMA with at-home dosing. It's a liquid treatment, it's taken by mouth or feeding tube, and it's delivered directly to you. Um, you store it in a refrigerator and you take it once a day by mouth. And the guesswork is gonna be eliminated because your doctor will calculate what your correct dose is based off of your uh, age and your weight. Let's take a look at the next slide, please. So my SMA support, when you're looking at, when you, when you begin this journey, it is a treatment journey, and you're talking about uh, considering a treatment for SMA, and you're starting to research and having conversations with your healthcare team and submitting start forms and navigating the insurance all the way up to when it gets delivered to you, that's a bit of a process. And we wanna make sure that you've got, that you feel supported throughout that journey and that you feel confident and as informed as possible. And that's where my SMA support comes in. And the PAL really is, uh, the main point of contact for my SMA support. So we're able to provide product education similar to what I'm doing now. So if you have any questions about the clinical trials, um, how to take it, how it works, uh, important safety information, you know, we can make sure that you're very comfortable with that. In addition to also navigating insurance um, and making sure you understand what your insurance coverage looks like and also being aware of potential resources that are available to you, such as patient assistance programs that might be available in case there are uh, challenges with insurance and then coordinating with our um, specialty pharmacy partner, Acredo, when it comes time to deliver it to your home. Now, again, I just wanna reiterate that my SMA support, including the PAL, does not provide medical advice, as that is always a conversation that you should have between you and your healthcare provider. Next slide. So, I. I I reviewed a lot of information in a, in a fairly short amount of time. So let me just sort of wrap this up and, and review some of the key highlights that I talked about. So at RISD, it improved motor function scores in two main studies of infants, children, and adults. It increased and maintained SMN protein levels in clinical studies. The safety of RISD is being studied in people two months to 60 years of age with types one, two, or three SMA. And it's the first and only oral treatment for SMA that is delivered to your door. You wanna make sure to reach out to your healthcare provider and talk to them if you feel like a RISD might be appropriate to you, appropriate for you, I'm sorry. And if you want more information, we would encourage you to also take a look at RISD.com where you can find more information, but you can also sign up for my SMA, SMA support and uh, have a pal reach out and make contact with you. And with that, next slide, please. I just wanna thank you for your time. It's very much been my privilege to be here with you today. A big thank you to Cure SMA, and I just want to wish everybody a happy and healthy week. Thank you so much, Jared. Um, this is Sarah with Cure SMA's Family Support Department, and I did just want to hop on. We actually had one question come in for Dr. Graham um, live, and he will be able to answer that now. So the question that came through is, Versed safe to give adults with SMA prior to Sinraza to ease the anxiety? Yeah, so this is a great question, and I, I think this gets back to um, you know the, what I was talking about, sort of conscious sedation. Um, and so I guess first of all, it, it's helpful to say that there's there's no no sedation um, or anesthetic um, that's completely contraindicated indicated in SMA. You may hear about it with other muscle problems. Um, there are things called core myopathies or even the young men with muscular, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, um, that there are certain things that they should not receive. Um, for SMA, that's 
not really an issue because of it, it's, it's a it's a it's a spinal motor neuron disease as opposed to a primary muscle disorder that there might be complications with. Um, but what it does highlight is that um, the monitoring needs to be appropriate. Um, and again, this sort of gets back to the oxygen question. So most of the time, when when you know anyone gets sedation, uh, they'll put on a SAT probe. Uh, they check to see what your heart rate is and what your oxygen level is. And so the first response is to give oxygen. Well, um, so for monitoring, if, if you're getting sedation, whether it's for a spinraza injection or anything else, um, and you're given Versed or propofol or ketamine or dexmedetomidine, there are any number of these, they should also think about monitoring carbon dioxide. And, and you know, if you, um, they can do that through a nasal cannula. Sometimes they're, they're the carbon dioxide monitors that, that are, uh, um, you can actually put on the skin. Those are less readily available. Um, but I think the key is, is that you should have the monitoring up front so that you're not just seeing, oh, am I, is my oxygen level low? Because by the time your oxygen level low is low, it means you have not been breathing effectively for a long time. Um, and so I should have my carbon dioxide monitor as well. That would be ideal. Um, uh, and then and then the question comes up about the choice of drugs. And it, it's nice, Versed is not um, is a nice drug because number one, there's actually a drug that you can use to reverse the effect. Uh, similar, um, different class, morphine has the same thing. You'll, you'll hear about, you know, in the community with drug overdoses for, with, with opiates, you can give Narcan or Naloxone. Um, there's a similar drug for uh, midazolam or Versed. Um, it's called Flumazenil. And so if there's an emergency, if you get an overdose, there's a way to reverse it. Regardless, um, what you want is you want someone who's there who can help with your breathing if there's a problem. And so, um, you know, this comes up with people who, when they get their wisdom teeth out, I've had a number of uh, um, adolescents uh, and actually young adults with SMA who've had wisdom teeth out. And the question is, you know, my orthodontist wants to give me sedation and that's that can be okay as long as your orthodontist is not the only person giving sedation and doing the procedure you want someone who's going to focus on your breathing and the sedation and the monitoring while the orthodontist or the surgeon or whomever does what they need to do um so i think the short answer is Versed is okay um i think with any medication it's it's okay is you start low and you do little steps up in dosing to get to that point where you're comfortable um and they can do the procedure safely so um so you know uh it, it's important also um not to necessarily insist on using a drug that maybe that person has never used before so if you get to a, a place and, they, and you say oh i want X, Y, and Z, and they say, well, I've never used that before, that's probably not a safe thing, and you either want to put off the procedure or, or work with them through another plan. Um, so hopefully that addressed that. I don't know if there are any other questions that have popped up in the meantime. Thank you so much. I think we're all set. We really appreciate that. And thank, thank you to Dr. Graham and Jared um, for your fantastic, informative presentations and your time today. And we also want to send a thank you to all of um, our attendees who joined in on the webinar. You're going to be receiving a follow-up email with a survey link, and we would greatly appreciate any feedback that you have to share as well. We're also thankful for our incredible support from our sponsors for making the Summit of Strength virtual webinar series possible. And like we said, if there's anything we can do for you or if you have any other additional questions, please email us at familysupport at curesma.org. Otherwise, we're all set. Thank you so much and have a great day, everyone.